Lorraine is going to read Psalm 107 for us here in a moment, but before she did that, I wanted to introduce it because it's a longer psalm than what we would typically read here on a Sunday night. It's 43 verses, uh, but as she reads it, what I want you to see is this pattern that just keeps getting repeated in it. It will be helpful if your Bibles are open to Psalm 107. You're going to keep uh, hearing this phrase, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. That's his covenant love, that Hesed love. Uh, and so it, it brings us through all of these different situations in life that these people are going through as, as they're being pushed down, crushed down really by the weight of the world. But yet God's Hesed love keeps bringing them back up out of it. Uh, so Lorraine will read that for us now. Give thanks. Does this thing work? Okay. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness and the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of the darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep, for he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. 
the waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. He turned rivers into a desert, flowing springs into thirsty ground, and fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who live there. He turned the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into flowing springs. There he brought the hungry to live, and they founded a city where they could settle. They sold fields and planted vineyards that yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them, and their numbers greatly increased, and he did not let their herds diminish. Then their numbers decreased, and they were humbled by oppression, calamity, and sorrow. He who pours contempt on the nobles made them wander in a tactless, trackless waste, but he lifted the needy out of their affliction and increased their families like flocks. The upright see and rejoice, but all the wicked shut their mouths. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Now we're going to use that very last verse that you just read for our call to worship tonight. Let the one who is wise heed these things that we have just read and ponder the loving deeds of the Lord. Let's prepare ourselves to worship God in a time of silent prayer. Well, we've read Psalm 107, so you know what's coming next. We're going to sing it. Uh, we're going to sing four verses out of the 13 that are in the hymnal. We're only going to sing four of them. Uh, so stand with the music and let's sing Psalm 107. us, we're reminded of what it is that we confess to believe about him. 
Uh, we're up to Article 17 here in our confession. Remember, our confession answers four questions, and we're halfway through now. We've talked about who and what God is. That's the first question. The second question is who and what are we? Uh, and now we're up to this third question. Having seen that we're sinful and in need of salvation, how is it that we experience and gain that salvation? Uh, let's confess it together. We believe that our good God, by his marvelous wisdom and goodness, seeing that man had plunged himself into both physical and spiritual death and made himself completely miserable, set out to find him, though man, trembling all over, was fleeing from him. And he comforted him, promising to give him his son, born of a woman, to crush the head of the serpent and to make him bless. And it's because our God did just that, crushed the head of the serpent and made us blessed that he welcomed you here tonight. He says to you, grace, mercy, and peace be yours. From God our Father who came to find us. Through Jesus Christ, his son, who gave his life that we might live. And through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. So the baseball stadium in Seattle, where the Mariners play, has a retractable roof that they can open up on these kind of days. Wouldn't that be nice if this is the way the church was? We could open the roof up and enjoy the beautiful weather outside because it hasn't always been that way these last few days. And, and now looking at the forecast uh, towards the end of this week, it looks like another inch and, inch and maybe even a little bit more of rain. And so that's the last thing we need, isn't it? But we'll pray that God will bring us some relief from this rain for sure. Uh, what else can we pray for tonight? Yeah, it's been quite a year for that. Now again, last night there was even more, wasn't there? Now, what's that? Today, too. Today yet too? Oh, wow. In that same area in southern Iowa and... Texas, Oklahoma, yeah, that, that alley, I guess is what they call that, right? The tornado alley. It's been a very active tornado year, hasn't it? Uh, and so a lot of people need prayers with, with, that tornado, with the tornadoes and storms. And in Arkansas also. In Arkansas, my, yeah. My niece was only two miles from the, the, the tornado in uh, Bella Vista. Oh, wow. Yeah, so all over the place. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that we read Psalm 107, though, tonight, is because even though in all this tumultuous weather and, and everything that's going on in this world, we're reminded, though, of God's covenant faithfulness, and so we can thank Him for that. Other things to pray for tonight. I didn't get an update from Steph this week on Jaylee. How, how are things going for her? Our synod meetings in the denomination start already this coming Wednesday night. Uh, the first two meetings that we have will be remote before we go to Michigan in a couple of weeks, so we'll keep that in prayer. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this absolutely beautiful evening that you've given us to enjoy here on the Lord's Day. We uh, thank you for the respite in the weather even though we know that even today all around us, both to the west and to the south and 
Maybe even to the east, there's all sorts of in, uh, instable weather and uh, storms and tornadoes. Father, it's just been quite a spring uh, with all sorts of devastation. Uh, even around us, uh, we thankfully haven't been struck by tornadoes, but uh, there's evidence of the overwhelming rain that we've gotten everywhere that we look in, in the fields, and that's tough to see. Uh, but uh, what a comfort it is for us to read like Psalms like what we read earlier in, in Psalm 107, that your unfailing Hesed love is with us all of the time, and that no matter what is going on around us, we remain firmly fixed in your hands, and so we thank you for that reminder, and uh, Father, we pray that that would continue to give us confidence, even in the midst of all of the uncertainty and all of the danger that, that is being faced uh, in this dangerous spring weather. We pray especially for those communities down south uh, in, in Arkansas and Oklahoma and Texas and southern Iowa, Missouri, all of these areas that have just been devastated by tornadoes day after day almost. It seems like there's been no let up for them. So Father, we pray that you uh, are with those people, that they could have peace in you even in the midst of the storms that they're facing. Father, tonight we pray especially for Jay Lee and, and the challenges that she continues to face. Uh, Father, again, you have shown your goodness to her uh, so, so often in so many different ways. Uh, you have continued to sustain her, and we thank you for that. And uh, now she faces even more challenges in this coming week. And so, uh, Father, continue to uphold her and, and give her strength. Uh, give, especially be with Steph, Stephanie and Austin as they... Uh, continue to be by her side and as they can yet have obligations and, and things that need to be done here and, and another daughter, Callie, that needs uh, attention as well that, that puts a lot of stress upon them. Father, we pray again that you uh, are just with them in this situation and the difficulties that they face because of that. Again, help us to cling to your covenant love even though things seem overwhelming for us at times. Father, we continue to pray for the Christian Reformed Church as a whole. We thank you for it and, and for the blessings that you have poured out on it over the last 150 years. Uh, Father, we pray that as the Synod meetings begin here this week already, that uh, things will go well, that we're able to do what needs to be done within our denomination. Uh, we pray especially for those of our number, the very few but, but stubborn at this point, who, who have taken a view contrary to what your word says uh, and are not listening to their brothers and sisters in the faith as we call them back. Uh, Father, we do pray that by the power of your spirit, you will break through that stubbornness, that, that you will uh, call them back to you and back to truth once again. We pray that we would be good ministers of that. It's difficult at times because we get frustrated and angry with them. Uh, but Father, help us to realize the patience that you have had with us, that we might have it with them. Uh, but also help us to know when it's time for us to draw that line and, and put them on the other side of it if they don't bow their knee to your word. It's a difficult decision to make, Father. And so I pray that you would uh, be with the delegates this year. And, and uh, again, we need your peace. We need that hesed love that you have promised to us over and over in your word. And so we pray for that uh, and for wisdom as we begin the deliberations here in just a couple of days. Father, be with us in the new week that we have before us now. Uh, we thank you for all of the graduates who are able to celebrate uh, both this weekend and this coming weekend. Uh, we thank you for the accomplishments that these kids have been able to uh, uh, do in their high school careers and and uh, we pray that you would continue to bless them now as they move on to the next stage of life. Be with all those who are traveling on this busy holiday weekend. We pray for safety there. Uh, and uh, again, Father, we thank you that all things are in your hands, and we pray for the confidence that comes from knowing that. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we prepare for God's word tonight, let's pray the prayer. Breathe on me, breath of God. Uh, there are three verses to that, so stand with the music and sing.
So actually, we're into our second week now of answering this third question, how it is that we're saved from the sin that we've put ourselves into. I wasn't here last week, uh, but had I, or if I were, and if we were continue to go and look at Article 16 of our confession, we see that this question gets answered by our confession, which is really just a summary of what the Bible says. It, it gets answered in such a way that puts the emphasis on God's sovereignty in our uh, salvation. It was God who elected us, is what we would have read in Article 16, out of our sin, chose us to be his own, and uh, gave himself to us. And we're going to see that continue to be worked out here this evening as we look at Article 17 how it is that God began to accomplish this work in our lives. Uh, you'll see that the screen, I'm just realizing, is incorrect. There should be the number one in front of John. It's 1 John chapter 4, not the Gospel of John. 1 John chapter 4. In my Bible here, that's on page 1,185. Uh, we read some of these verses in the service this morning. We'll dig into them a little bit deeper here now this evening. We'll start reading at verse 7, and we're going to read through verse 10, just a short passage tonight. Hear now the word of the Lord. John, 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let's thank God for this. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word once again. Uh, once again this evening, we're going to see how varied and diverse the Bible is. Uh, we read history this morning about the fall of Babylon. Uh, this evening, we're going to read uh, very different words or very different literature, at least in the way these words are written. There's going to be a beauty and a poetic element to what John has written to us here. Uh, but all of these words point to the same thing. They all point us to our need for Jesus Christ, uh, that need that has been fulfilled by him through you. Uh, and so as we can come to understand our salvation all the more tonight, we pray for your blessing upon our time together. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So yeah, there's different literary styles in the Bible, isn't there? There's different literary styles in the New Testament, we have four separate Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them written by very different men uh, with different goals in mind, different audiences that they wrote to. Uh, we have different types of epistles, letters in the Bible. The, the ones that we're often the most familiar with are these ones that come from Paul that, that contain so much of our doctrine, but then we have Letters here from John and from Peter and from James and Jude and all of them are written differently. And John, in my opinion, is an acquired taste. It's always hard for me to wrap my head around John because I think differently and you do too because of your Western culture and mindset that, that we're all part of. This is how we think. Right? There's a point, and then you say a couple of things about that point, and then you go on and you make 
the next point. <laughs> this is the way our brains work. This is not the way that John's brain works. John is very Jewish uh, and, and a Near Eastern mindset as, as he goes through things. But if we were to put his words into our type of outline, this is what it would look like. Now, you're not going to go wrong doing this. And, and I've, I've said this often, that if you really want to come to, you're, you're, you're really wanting to come to a, an understanding of a passage of Scripture like this, uh, maybe you have to give a devotion or something at a meeting that you're going to. The quickest and easiest way to understand a passage is just uh, copy it like out of Bible Gateway or something like that, paste it into a word processor, and put it into an outline. You see, we've got three main movements to this text. Love comes from God. Here's how God showed his love. And then this definition of love again. So this... There's this repetition. You see that loopiness that's in there? Love comes from God. Okay, let's talk about how God showed his love, even though we've already defined it. And then again, John goes back to what he was already talking about. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. It seems like he's saying the same thing over and over and over again. And if you're familiar with John's letters, you're familiar with this loopy type of style that he uses. You can see it a little bit in his gospel, the way he writes it. John's gospel is different than the other three uh, on a number of different factors. And we also see it in the other book of the Bible that he wrote, which is the book of Revelation. <laughs> Revelation is hard to understand, isn't it? Because it seems like it tells the same thing over and over and over again, which is what it does. And it's because John uses a different outline style, this chiastic style that we've talked about so often that we especially see in Hebrew poetry. Uh, and I've really noticed this in John's letters these last couple of months especially. It, it's one of these things, once you start to notice this pattern, you see it all over the place, and especially in a writer like John. So, so here's how John lays out this passage, and you're going to see we're going to kind of nuance it a little bit when we understand it the way that he does. What is love? Well, love comes from God. He says that people show love in order to indicate that they're born of God. And so consequently, if you don't love, you must not know God. Why? Because God is love. So you see, so far, his outline looks like what our outline would look like. It moves kind of down and to the right. Here's where it's going to be different. It's going to start moving back to the left. You see, there's correspondence between that first B point and what we call B prime or the second B point. How do people show love? Well, they do it to indicate that they're born of God. How does God show love? Well, he did it by sending his son so that we might live through him. And then John ends right where he starts. What is love? What's the definition of it? Well, it's not what we do. It's what God has done. So if we understand John's point this way, we see that this point comes right in the middle. And this is really the whole point of John's first letter. That if you don't love, you don't know God because God is love. This is what John wants us to understand. That if we're Christians, if we believe these set of claims that, that we have as Christians, well, our life is going to look drastically different than if we didn't believe those things. And if your life doesn't look different, well, then you probably have got a problem with what you believe. So that's the point of this passage. Now, it just so happens that tonight, the reason that we come to this passage tonight is because of the third verse, which is a little bit outside of John's main point. Remember, his main point was that whoever does not love does not know God because God is love, back in verse 8. Now, we're going to be looking at verse 10 here, though, for the most part this evening, that this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Well, guess what? He wrote verse 10 in that same chiastic pattern that he wrote the whole passage in. You see the artistry of what he's got going here? It's like for most of us, when we walk by a, 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 a nice chair that's been carved by somebody out of wood or, or a good carpenter put it all together, I don't know what it took to put that chair all together. I just know it has four legs and I can sit in it and it holds me up. It does what a chair is supposed to do. Those of you who do woodworking, though, 
And, and you look at that and you see the artistry that's involved in it, you appreciate that a whole lot more than what most people do because you see what it took to put that together. That's really what we're talking about here. Anybody can understand John's gospel, whether you understand this outline style or not. But what we're trying to do here is just appreciate it all the more and, and, and just look at how he puts these poetic structures within poetic structures. Here's how this works. This is what really how this verse is laid out. Again, he starts with the definition of love. This is love. Uh, how do people show love? Well, we don't <laughs> on our own, John says. It's not that we loved God, but there's his middle point. That point C there. God loved us. We have to start there. This has to be the foundation of our understanding of how it is that God saved us. We're saved because God loved us. And so then he just works his outline back again. Uh, we, we don't show love. How does God show love? Well, he shows love because he sent his son. What is the definition of love? This is interesting here to me because if you were to ask a bunch of people, uh, uh, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, if you were to go down the street and ask them what love is, you're going to get a hundred different answers because it's so subjective and, and most people are going to associate love with a feeling that somebody has for somebody else. Uh, that's not the way that we see love presented to us in the Bible. Love is always presented in an objective way. This is what love is. God sent his son to atone for your sins. That's the demonstration of love. It really has nothing to do with a feeling. The feeling is secondary to what God did for us. So that's really our point here. Is as we begin, we have to have this foundation that our salvation is totally based on God's love for us first. And our love for him doesn't kick in until we first experience that love he has for us. So let's look at our doctrine here tonight from Article 17. What is it we are being, what are, what are we confessing to believe here? Well, we believe that our good God, by his marvelous wisdom and goodness, now look at how the confession roots our salvation again and who God is. This is why it, it's, it's, we're, in, we're almost up to June now, aren't we? We're almost halfway through this year. And we started looking at the confession at the beginning of the year. We spent the whole first half of the year really talking about who and what God is. Why? So that we could understand our salvation because it's based on God's attributes, His goodness, His wisdom. So God... Out of his goodness and out of his wisdom, he sees that we, that mankind, has plunged himself in this manner into both physical and spiritual death and made himself completely miserable. This is what we've accomplished, right? <laughs> if we want to look at what we've accomplished, it's this. We've, we've brought death upon ourselves, both physical and spiritual death, and we've made ourselves completely miserable. Now, here's our salvation. We believe that our good God set out to find us even though we were trembling all over and fleeing from him right here's the words that we looked at this morning uh, as God's greeting to us uh, that episode in the garden and, and God what, what we're going to notice here in about four passages in a row and I had to stop at four just because that was enough to make the point but we're going to see these rhetorical questions that God continues to ask people as he's bringing them comfort, right? Adam and Eve are hiding in shame. They're, they're trembling all over, as our confession put it, in fear, not knowing what's going to happen next. And God comes and he asks them, where are you? Now, of course, we know that God is omniscient, that he knows all things. He's not asking this question because he needs the facts filled in for his report. No, he, he knows this, but, but this... This is a, Adam, where are you? I, I'm, I'm here to bring you grace. I'm not here to crush you. He could have done that from afar, right? He didn't need to come down to the garden in order to smite Adam and Eve. He could have done that from afar. He created the whole universe just by speaking. So he comes asking this question, where are you? 
We see that just a chapter later. This fam- we talked about this this morning too. Uh, Cain and Abel, the Lord said to Cain. Again, this rhetorical question, where is your brother Abel? Well, of course God knows the answer to that, that Abel is dead at this point. And then, of course, we see that insolence that we looked at this morning, this attitude that, that Cain has as he's separated himself from God. Now, well, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? But again, this pattern is being set. God comes, and he comes asking rhetorical questions. Genesis chapter 11. What's going on in Genesis chapter 11? You've got to say it a little bit louder. Have some confidence now, even if you're wrong. The Tower of Babel is going on in Genesis chapter 11. And I know that our morning servants are already going long uh, as we go through these narrative chapters or books of the Bible. It's, it's hard to, to condense that down. But, but we're leaving so much of it on the table because what's, what do you notice even just saying the Tower of Babel and the city of Babylon? Is there some correspondence there? Yes, there is. There's all sorts of correspondence between Babel and Babylon. So uh, these people in Babel, right, they're building a tower to, to show their own glory, to basically ascend to God's level. That's what the Tower of Babel is all about. Uh, and of course, God knows what's going on. Uh, but he goes and he says, let's go down to the city and, and see this tower that they're building. Again, he does not need to do that from on, uh, uh, he doesn't need to come down to see it. He, can, he knows what's going on from afar. He can see it from there. But yet we get this picture of God coming down. And then we get a picture of God's grace being applied to these Babylonians at that point in time because he confuses their language. And no, no, I told you to scatter. And he physically does something to them then, so all of their language changes so that they have to scatter. He shows them his grace as he comes down. Again, he could have crushed that city from afar. Now this morning we see the fall of the great city of Babylon thousands of years later. And how is it that God does it? (laughs) By confusing their language again, right? Those those, uh, astrologers and magicians and diviners and stuff remember they they could see the words on the wall but they couldn't read them even though they were ordinary aramaic words <laughs> so th- there's that irony there again that we see so often here in the old testament the sense of humor that god has he starts off the city of babel by confusing their language pushes them out and then when it's time to crush the city of babel that he used uh, to take the ex- israelites into exile he once again confuses their language So again, we see all of this irony that's in the Bible. Elijah, right? We know what's going on here in 1 Kings 19. Elijah has just presided over that contest between uh, the, the prophets and the priests of Baal and God, and it's God who sends down the fire and consumes the altar, and uh Elijah sees that, and everybody else sees that. Elijah thinks, oh, finally, everyone's going to convert now. They're going to know that Jehovah is God, and everything is going to be the way that it's supposed to be. But that's not exactly the way things work out, is it? And that's just amazing. People see this fire from heaven, but yet that's still not enough for them to come and make themselves in line with God's law, because Their hearts are still hard. It doesn't matter what evidence they see. And so Elijah goes away from that episode and falls into this deep depression. And he goes into this cave. And and essentially in this cave, he he asks God to to take his life. He's, He's just done with it. But God comes to him. The word of the Lord came to him. And again, this rhetorical question that brings grace. What are you doing here, Elijah? God comes to find his people. We see it in the New Testament. Uh, Saul nears Damascus on his journey, right? He's going to go persecute Christians. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. And guess what? Another rhetorical question bringing grace. Saul falls to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So God keeps coming for his people coming with grace, coming in this gentle manner, not coming to crush them, 
uh, but coming to give them grace. So our good God set out to find him. Right? You always see us represented in these singular terms because remember, that's how we're represented before God. Uh, we all stand in either Adam or Christ, and so that's why these terms are singular. All of us are represented, though, in that. Adam was hiding in the garden, trembling in fear, and so we were too. God set out to find us. And once God found us, he comforted us. Right? He didn't come to crush us, though that's what we deserved, and promised to give him his son, born of a woman. Well, we're familiar with that passage too, Genesis 3.15. Just a few verses later, right? We call this the, the proto euangelion the very first evidence of the gospel, this first evidence of good news. Right? God didn't come to crush. He came to bring this good news that there will be enmity between you and the woman. Okay? He's speaking to the serpent here. Between your offspring and hers. Now, it's an interesting word there, offspring. Because is that singular or plural? It's both in this sense. <laughs> that's what makes it so interesting. Uh, because it's talking about the offspring of the devil, that's plural. It's talking about the offspring of the woman, that's us, so that's plural. But then you see that next pronoun there, he, singular. Who's it talking about? Eve's offspring in general, or is there just one? one in particular. It's Christ that's being referred to. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now we can be confident in, in uh, interpreting it that way because Paul talks about this in Galatians, talking about how that same word was used uh, in context of Abraham, even thousands of years later after Eve was given that promise. Abraham's offspring are going to be blessed. His seed is going to be blessed. Uh, and Paul says those promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Now, Scripture doesn't say and to his seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. That's what the entire Old Testament is pointing toward. Uh, Galatians 4, uh, just a chapter later. Paul writes, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Why is this so necessary, that Jesus be born of a woman? Well, we find out here in Romans chapter 8, we read this this morning too. These are words that are worth memorizing. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by sarks, the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Homoousius is that word likeness. And that doesn't mean anything to you. But probably a thousand years ago, maybe 1,300 years ago, you're familiar with the Nicene Creed, right? It's one of our primary creeds that all Christian churches agree on. The Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed are two of those big ones. And the Nicene Creed is all about the Trinity. It really is what sets us apart from the Eastern Orthodox Church. They did not sign on to that. Because there was two ways that Jesus could be explained. He could be explained in his relationship to God as homoousius or homoousius. There's one letter difference there between those two Greek words. It means the same substance of God or a like substance to God. And these men argued about that one letter for decades because they wanted to get it right. They wanted to understand what the Bible said about who Jesus was. Now, in this particular instance, they used that, or Paul used that second example, homoousius. The likeness of sinful flesh. Because if he would have left that letter out and Jesus was homoousius with sinful flesh, that would mean that Jesus also had sinful flesh, but he didn't. He's got all the attributes of our flesh, everything that we have, but it's not the same. 
It's like our flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Because he's born of a woman, but yet his father is not of Adam. That's the difference between Christ and us. It's a very similar type of language here in Philippians. A famous passage here on who Christ is. Christ made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant being made homoousius or homoousius in human likeness. A nature of a servant. This is why we keep coming back to the NIV more than any other uh, translation. They're all good. Uh, but I really like how the NIV does this sort of thing. The word there, nature, you understand that Greek word because it's morphe. Uh, something that's got a morph to it, has got a shape to it, right? Uh, and so all of the other translations translate that very literally, that, that Jesus took the very form of a servant. And that's a good literal translation, but that's not really what Paul means there. This is what he means, that Jesus has our very nature, because he's born of a woman. It's not our very form. He doesn't look like all of us. We all look different. No, he's got our nature because he's born of a woman. He's got a likeness to our humanity. It's similar in every way, but it's not the same because it's not enslaved to sin the way that our human nature is. So you see the difference that, that these, <laughs> these very delicate differences in how a word is spelled makes all the difference in the world in what it means uh, and how God arranged this really to the nth degree for our salvation. Now, people can, you know, somebody could come to Christ and, and of course you don't need to know all of this to be a Christian. You just need to know that Jesus died for your sin and has set you free. But at the same time, we can keep digging and keep understanding and keep learning about what and who Jesus is and, and how this all applies to us. And the more we understand this, the more solid that ground is going to be underneath our feet so that when those challenges come, the way they came time after time after time in Psalm 107 that we read earlier, we have solid ground to stand on because we understand it well. This is why we spend the time doing what we're doing. So we believe that our good God set out to find us, to find him, mankind, and he comforted him, promising to give him his son, born of a woman, to crush the head of the serpent. Oh, I love this line, don't you? Uh, this is the first thing that Jesus says. This is the good news that your head is going to be crushed, Satan. So often in our day and age, we, Christianity gets reduced again to just feelings of, of peace and, and of love and joy and so on. And certainly Christianity includes those things. But look at the kind of language that God uses in describing what our salvation is all about. This is war. That's what we talked about this morning. We're involved in a war. And war means that somebody's head is going to get crushed. And it's going to be yours, serpent. This is how the gospel begins. A head is going to be crushed and it's going to belong to Satan. And the only thing that you're going to be able to do is strike his heel. Romans 16, this is the end of the book of Romans. Paul is saying goodbye to everybody uh, in Romans chapter 16. But it has this beautiful benediction in there. The God of peace. You know, wh wh what comes into your mind when you think of the God of peace? Maybe you're thinking of a nice green meadow like Psalm 23 where he makes us to lie down in green pastures or something like that. That's not the God of peace that Paul has in his mind inspired by the Holy Spirit. Here's how Paul puts it. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. This is to be our attitude as Christians. That we're at war with sin. And not at war with sin and other people as much as what we are with, uh, with war at war with sin in ourselves. We have to crush it under our feet. And as we do that, the grace of our Lord Jesus will be with us. So we believe our good God set out to find us. He comforted us, promising to give us his son, born of a woman, to crush the head of the serpent. 
And then finally, to make us blessed. This is important here, this little line that was added on to our confession as to what we believe, because we tend to forget about this part. We tend, again, to reduce our Christianity to our salvation. God saved us from our sin and, in a sense, gave us a big do-over. Now, go out there and do it right. See if you can do it a little bit better than what you did last time. That's, again, not necessarily the picture that the Bible paints for us. As we look at the first psalm, remember we say that Psalm 1 and 2, they form the context for the 148 psalms that come after them. And this is how Psalm 1 begins. Blessed is the man who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the seat of mockers. Who is the man that's being referred to in Psalm chapter 1? What do you think? Come on now, let's have some confidence. Even if you're wrong, let's just have an answer. What, what do you think? I think you're right. It's us as Christians. It's, it's got a dual meaning, doesn't it? Certainly this is Christ that's being referred to there, the man. Uh, this is who is blessed. But Irma is absolutely right. We are in Christ. So that means that we are also blessed. We're different. We've been made holy. We now have to live different. We're not going to walk in step with the wicked. We're not going to stand in the way of sinners. We're not going to sit in the company of mockers because we're in Christ and we're different. Right? And so it changes our attitude and how we live. What was the first announcement that Jesus made there in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are all of the different categories that he gave, but we are to live a blessed life. That, that word in Greek, makarios, blessed, it, it really does mean happy. Uh, this has to be our attitude. There's really no room for pessimism in Christianity. Uh, not in general, at least, maybe on a day-to-day -day basis, a little pessimism isn't bad, but, but, but in general, we are to be optimistic people. We're blessed people. We're people who have been made whole again through Jesus Christ. Uh, and so, all of the psalms that come after this now, now delineate how it is that we are to live as blessed people. So, in conclusion here, we believe that our good God, remember this is all based in the attributes of God, and His goodness is one of those primary attributes, set out to find us in our sin. He comforted us. He promised to give us his son, born of a woman, to crush the head of the serpent and also then to make us blessed to change our lives. So let's thank God for that salvation. Father in heaven, we thank you for this change that you have brought about in us. We are the ones who put ourselves into sin. Certainly we were born into it. That was not our choice, but all we've done on our own is add to our misery and make things worse. And so we thank you that you loved us first, that you set out to find us, and, and that you didn't just do that once, but over and over again in, the, in both the Old and New Testament, we see that same pattern from you coming down to your people who have walked away from you in sin and gently restoring them to the salvation that has been earned for them through Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that we would understand this well. We thank you for the simplicity of the gospel, but at the same time, uh, we want to be people who understand it as deeply and as richly as what we possibly can, and that takes hard work. And so help us to do that work, to know our scripture and to know how it all fits together so that we can have confidence for ourselves and share that confidence in with Christians who maybe haven't been blessed as much as we have to learn the kind of things that we've learned. Father, we do pray that uh, you would continue to send out your spirit to change the hearts of those who are set against you, to draw them back to you, to come and find them and, and call them back in the way that you have so often and, and that you have done even with us. Be with us now in this week that lies ahead. We pray that we would live in a blessed way because that's what you've transformed us to be. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
We'll respond to what we've heard from God's word tonight with I sought the Lord and afterward I knew. We'll sing two verses of it. blessing for this week comes from just a few verses later from what we read in John, 1 John chapter 4. People of God, we know and we rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. <clears throat> 